This video is part of the Reaching Students with Disabilities Symposium Series. And service dogs are becoming more and more common in everyday life, as well as in the college and the high school. And there are some difficulties connected with that. Just to, to show you where I'm coming from, um, I was a long-term member on the Committee on Chemical Safety. I'm now a liaison to it. My current committee at HCS is Chemists with Disabilities. In my real life, I raise service dog puppies, and I have two disabled daughters. So I'm in my community, and I am a strong advocate of service dogs. I've seen incredible things they can do. But there are some considerations for us as chemists. This, well, it's not Phil. It's a yellow lab rather than the black lab, but everybody would look at that dog and immediately assume it's a service dog. It's got a harness on. The person who's walking it is, has a white cane. It's a seeing eye dog, so it, which is a trademark, but everybody assumes that. Now, there's another couple of dog pictures. Which one or ones are the service animals? or none of them. There is absolutely no way of telling by looking at it. We saw Max is a little guy. We saw Phil, who's a lab. You've got dogs up there wearing vests. You've got dogs without vests. There is no requirement that a service dog wear a vest. You can go online and buy a vest for your pet dog if you want to take him with you anywhere. The, the animal in the lower right, lower left up there is a horse. <laughs> it is a legal service animal. As a matter of fact, one of the airlines has just issued guidelines for having a service horse on the plane. These are miniature horses. They are smaller than the Irish wolfhounds I used to have, uh, and they are allowed. They have some definite benefits. They're long-lived. They're prey rather than pet predators, so they're aware of their surroundings. And if you have someone with a balance issue, I've got a horse right here that's better for that than a dog is. But they're the only legal service animals or dogs and horses. According to the ADA, a service dog, and I'm, we haven't seen horses in the lab, so I'm going to limit it to dogs, but a service dog must be individually trained to perform a task specifically related to the partner's disability. It may be physical, intellectual, psychiatric, or sensory disability. It does not need any certification does not need any identification. May be trained by an organization, as Phil was, or trained by an individual, as Max was. And in some cases, it may be a miniature horse. So, where the complications come in? Emotional support animals. They can be anything. Uh, there was a recent case over the summer where somebody tried to take an emotional support peacock through Newark Airport. Uh, it can be any, any kind of an animal at all. It provides comfort, but it doesn't do a physical task, and that's the key for a service dog. And then you have therapy dogs, and they interact on a, a more general setting, a hospital, school. My, my keeper dog at home is a therapy dog. The problem that you have is a student or a colleague or a staff member comes up to you and says, I want to bring my service dog with me. There are only two questions that you can ask that person. The first one is, is the dog required because of a physical dis because of a disability? That's a yes or no answer. You may not ask what the nature of the disability is. You can, they can say yes whether it's true or not, and you have to accept it. The second question, what task or tasks has the dog been trained to carry out? That's where a lot of people who try to pass off fake service dogs get caught. 
because they don't have a task specifically for it. But you cannot ask to demonstrate the task. You can simply ask what task it was. Right? The problem that you have is a lot of people have decided they want to take their dogs with them everywhere. You have celebrities on television boasting that, well, I've got this dog and I want to take it with me when I travel, and so I will call it a service dog. I had somebody come up to me when I was raising a puppy and said, well, that's a neat idea. Can, how do I get my dog certified as a service dog? Well, I'm thinking, okay, maybe the person has a hidden disability that I don't see. So I said, well, you know, do you have a disability that your dog will help? Oh, no, just I fly back and forth to California a lot. <laughs> um, okay. I kept it clean on my response, <laughs> but I was tempted. So according to the ADA, a service dog is allowed to accompany its partner into any public area, and that's any area where members of the public are allowed. That's our classrooms, that's our schools, that's even our laboratories. Right? And reasonable, reasonable accommodations have to be made to allow the service dog access. So you can restrict the service dog in general if it will cause a safety or health hazard. That's where laboratory sessions come in. If it's not under control or if it's not housebroken. Right. So someone comes to you and says they want to bring a dog into your classroom or into your um, laboratory. What do you have to consider in there? What does the dog do that will be required during that laboratory, right? The dogs I raise are for disabilities like um, a wheelchair, uh, someone who has brain injury, someone who's autistic, a hearing loss. If you're in a wheelchair, you would want your dog to be able to pick up something off the floor and give it to you. That's not going to happen in the lab. You don't want your dog picking up things. So that kind of a service is not needed. On the other hand, a dog who's a diabetic alert dog might have to be there 24-7 because they smell the uh, partner's breath as an indication of a level, uh, a, a sugar level change. And so that person might need that dog during the lab. Right? What's the exposure of the dog to hazardous chemicals and procedures? We consider that for our students, but we have to consider it for the dog as well. And then the safety of others in the laboratory. That is not, I don't want to say that's first and foremost because it isn't. If a surface dog came into this room and one of you had an allergy, the dog takes priority in this room. You would have to accommodate the dog not vice versa. So we do consider the safety of others in the lab, but we have to work around that. Right? So here's a dog. This picture was published in Kevin Engineering News a couple of years ago of a safety dog in the lab, of a service dog in the lab. He's got booties on, he's got swim goggles on, and he's sitting on a mat. Right? And accompanying that is a picture of some students in the lab. Close to shoes, aprons, goggles, right? Not quite the same level of safety for the dog. On the other hand, this is a service dog that's used for going into a hazardous situation. He's got a full uh, Tigon bodysuit on, he's got booties on, he's got a hood and his own air inlet on it. All right, but this, this protection is not needed in general. This is a more practical approach. The dog has basically a lab coat on. Uh, it's not quite as covered as I would like to see, but it has some protection for its body. It's on a mat. It has booties on. It does not have goggles on because the partner and the instructor decided that in that situation it was okay not to wear goggles. Right? But think of it. We're in a teaching lab. What are the hazards? Drippings, and, and we've all seen these in our labs, right? Dripping, spill, splash chemicals, broken glass on the floor from your lab or from the lab two weeks ago that wasn't cleaned up. Heavier than air vapors, which of course you should be doing in the fume hood, but not necessarily. Uh, solids, 
that got brushed off a bench. Noises. You're in an instrument lab and an air compressor comes on. A hood comes on. Suddenly you've got a shocking noise. Moving equipment. So you want to protect the dog. Where are you going to put it? Some possible locations are by, your, by the student's bench, all right, sitting next to the bench. Um, you saw the picture on the flyer of the, uh, my daughter, actually, in the wheelchair with a recessed space under the bench. A dog could fit under there. Some people put it against a wall if there's a coat rack on the side of the lab. Put it under a coat rack. Take a portable kennel and put it inside the lab or outside the lab. Uh, put it in a non-lab room that's adjacent. All right. All right. You're going to have to figure out the best way to do it. And so what do you want to consider? What service is the dog providing? Again, he's not going to pick up things off the floor. He's not going to hand things. He's not going to carry things in the lab, no matter what it is. But a hearing impaired student, it could be a warning that something is going on. Visually impaired student may have some needs that would require the dog. Someone with seizure disorder, diabetes, might need that dog. Is there an alternative that's acceptable to the dog's partner? All right. Um, Deanna said she doesn't bring her dog into the lab. She has alternatives for it. And so you want to work that through and talk to the student and think about your situation. Right? How does the dog interact and alert the partner? Um, one of my puppies that I raised is a hearing dog. And the way a hearing dog alerts the partner is it comes up and whops your thigh with its nose. Well, that's fine. Suppose the dog jumps up on you to alert you, and you're standing there with a beaker of chemicals. That's dangerous. All right? So you want to think about how that alert goes on. And what emergency procedures do you need in that lab to get the dog and the partner out safely together, hopefully? All right? Further considerations. What areas of the lab are safe or potentially hazardous? Would your balance room be a safer place? Would an instrument lab be a safer place than an orgo lab? I would argue yes. So there are some situations that are better than others. What are the hazards due to chemicals used and the operations con conducted? An instrument lab is low hazard. PCHEM lab is relatively low hazard. Orgo, up there. <laughs> I would argue, I'm a physical chemist, I would argue that organic chemicals either stink, give you cancer, or both, but <laughs> um, all right. what equipment protection is appropriate for that dog? Do you want his body covered? Because think of it, dog is on the floor. That dog's whole body is exposed to something that's filled, not just his feet. He's walking on things, his feet are covered and going to be exposed. Eye protection, all of that has to be considered with the dog. And what's necessary to minimize or prevent negative impact on others in the lab? Is that dog going to be blocking an aisle? Is that dog going to be in a high uh, traffic situation? Is that, are your aisles fairly narrow? Is the dog going to be in the way there? Right. So what we would recommend is that the institution, not the, chem, not the chemistry department, but the institution have a procedure in place. And this is very variable. If you go on different institutions and you look at the different uh, procedures, they have a wide range. This happens to be Westminster College. I'm not going to read it all. I don't necessarily say this is the be all and end all. But if you look at this, uh, you have a written policy for the service dogs which talks about teaching laboratories, talks about mechanical rooms, areas where protective clothing is necessary or off limits to service animals. Well, you could argue that's a lab coat as well. But areas where there's a danger, what kind of things are a danger to the service animal. But then you have a procedure for an exemption. My lab is safe 
I can deal with it. I can put the dog in a safe situation. The student needs it. There's an exemption that we can get, all right? And you want to spell out who makes that exemption and how does it go, all right? Emergency procedures. If that student and that dog have to be evacuated, even if the dog is not in the lab, is in an adjacent room, how do you get the dog out? If the dog's partner is injured or there's an emergency there and someone has to go in and take the, the human partner out, how's the dog going to react to you taking away its partner? How do you deal with that? Um, all of those situations you really want to think of ahead of time. Th those slides were all from one university. This is from UC Davis. Much shorter policy. Uh, pretty much incorporating the first part, no emergency procedures or anything of that type, but basically saying that the determination requires an individualized assessment of the nature, duration, and severity of the risk, the probability that an injury will occur, and whether reasonable modifications will mitigate it. So again, it's leaving it subjectively up to you. All right? So what do you want to do? How are you going to deal with it? Sit down and talk. That talk should be between the dog's partner, the human partner in the, in the chain. It should incorporate the laboratory supervisor, the instructor in the lab, the department chair as well, probably, if you're in that kind of a situation, because it's something that's going to impact all of them. And any institutional representatives that deal with student services. They know the law. You know your lab and you know your situations. And so you have to come to a meeting of the minds on it. I, I definitely would not support a policy that says no dogs allowed in the lab. There are valid and good reasons for it. I could give, give you so many examples of how service dogs have positively impacted someone's life and ability to work. You don't want to say you can't take it in. You do, don't want to say, yes, the law says you can, because it may not be safe for the human partner, for the dog, and for the other people in the lab. And nobody who has a service dog wants to endanger their dog. They want the best situation for them. One thing I should mention here, um, I'm just about finished uh, on it, but um, a special category comes in, like in my situation. I raise the service dog puppies. Most organizations that raise service dogs, they may breed the dogs, they may have someone else breed them, they might buy them as puppies, most breed their own. But you can't make an eight-week-old puppy a service dog, <laughs> no matter how sweet it is. The dog has to be older, it has to be mature, it has to have some basic training. And that's the job usually of volunteer puppy raisers. And that's what I do. Um, Marta knows she's seen most of my puppies now, and, and most of my colleagues here in New York have seen them. Um, we get a puppy at the age of two months, and we raise it for about a year and a half. And we do the basic training. And then it gets disability training after that. Now, those puppies in training, depending on the state that you are in, have special rights. In New York State, a puppy in training for a service dog has the full rights of a service dog. So you would have to go through these discussions with that. In my state of New Jersey, they don't. And so we would do it by consensus. I have, at my college, we have four pairs of students who are raising puppies. And they bring them to class with permission of the instructor. My rule is you don't bring that puppy anywhere near a lab. Um, I don't even walk my puppy through the lab, even if it hasn't been in service, because I don't know what's on the floor. I'm not going to expose it. I don't have to. But service uh, puppies in training you want to be able to look at and see what the law is, as well as what common sense says. To, the, to reiterate, there is no documentation 
for service dog required. All that is required is somebody says, I have the answer to those two questions. And that has opened the floodgates to people who, I have a therapy dog, that's the same as a service dog. I have an emotional support animal, that's the same as a service dog. They aren't. But the reality is that if someone comes up and says, this is my service dog, and even if they can't answer the two questions, if they're asked, and but more importantly, if they don't know the answers and you say, I'm sorry, it's not a service dog, you cannot bring it into my classroom, my restaurant, my store, my bus, whatever it might happen to be, you're going to find yourself plastered all over the, the nightly news and the YouTube that you've denied access to a service dog. Nobody stops to ask if it's a real service dog. So that's a real issue. And um, most of the organizations are trying to get some verification, some certification that dogs are, but there is nothing there. So I would just like to thank all the people who have helped out on here. Uh, Canine Companions for Independence, you may have picked up a flyer if you haven't, do. Uh, we are the oldest and the largest service dog provider in the country. We provide $40,000 value dogs to individuals with disabilities absolutely free. And if anybody wants to raise a puppy, see me. We would also love to get more. Um, as I say, the Committee on Chemical Safety, Chemists with Disabilities, and then peer reviewers for several articles I've written. And that's, that's one of my last graduates. That's Gracie. Uh, enthusiastically greeting her brand new partner the day she graduated. <laughs> so they, um, the um, service dogs in the lab, that's the flyer that you've got in your materials for the symposium series. The other is an article that's in Journal of Chemical Education, uh, chem sorry, Chemical Health and Safety. So all right, I think we probably have time for one or two questions. That's about it. Yeah. Hang on. I can put your well, that's all right. They need it. They need it for the oh, for, for the long spring. Long. So I have a twofold question because you seem to be absolutely very well versed in this. My first question is one of the things you actually mentioned about who takes priority if there is conflict. Um, what is your advice on handling a situation where there's no other alternative, for example, for a student who has an allergy and because of their schedule, they cannot take another section. Because that's one thing you could do. It you happens. Them in another right. section. Yeah. How would you handle that situation? I would send it to disability <laughs> services, to be perfectly honest. It's, it's a tough one. Yeah. You'd have to sit down and negotiate. It may be that, you know, um, I probably have more dog hair on my clothes right now than you would get from my dog being in the lab with me. Uh, so if I'm up here and you're in that back corner of the, of the room, that may be perfectly okay. Um, and you'd, ha you'd have to work it out individually. But it, it is a hard one. Uh, people say, but, you know, I'm paying tuition. Uh, I should have the right to get in here. And the partner is saying, my dog is effectively the same as my wheelchair, as my white cane, as my crutches. It's a tool. It is something I need. So, And what advice can you give people in situations where their institution doesn't have a policy, their department doesn't have a policy, and their disability services has no idea how to handle the situation, and here it is, maybe two or three days before classes start, and you get contact. By the way, you have a student that's going to have a service animal in your lab. We had that situation at my university. I've been raising puppies now for 10 years and saying to my university, we need a policy, guys, because these are coming in. Uh, this past uh, spring, we had a student who brought a dog into the residence hall and said, this is a service dog. And we didn't have a written policy. And basically, after a little bit of discussion, and they realized the dog was um, 
leaving remains in a number of places, was not well trained, and they basically said, well, I'm sorry, the dog has to go. Um, but it's hard. So my college has finally gotten a policy. It's not as strong as I would like, not as complete, but. Are there any resources, either through ACS or otherwise, to develop policies? There are policies you could, the, uh, not general ones, you'd have to go on to different schools and look at policies or look at some of the publications. Okay, I can take one more question because Brian just stuck his head out as if to say we're finished. Ashley? <laughs> can you, can, can you pass that up here? No, I don't want to go on all night, Brian. They want to go home. So you mentioned the problem of how you look like a horrible person if you deny a dog that's clearly not a service mm -hmm. dog. What are your suggestions if that occasion happens? What do you do? If you don't think it's a service dog, I would ask the two questions because people will lie on the first one, yeah. you know. I mean, is that dog required? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely it's required. What test does it do? That's where you get them primarily. And if that happens, then you can go to your academic administrator or worst case scenario, go to security and say that dog is, is not appropriate in here. Uh, there have been too many cases where fake service dogs have been aggressive, have actually bitten or frightened people and uh, real service dogs, and it's an unsafe situation. There's got to be a way that they come out and give us some some certification, but not yet. All right. All right. Um, I think most of the speakers are still here and would be happy to talk to you uh, if you have any specific questions. We do have questionnaires out there, evaluations for the program, and we'd love to have you fill them out. If there's anything that Committee on Chem uh, Chemistry with dis uh, Chemists with Disabilities can help. Oh, I should mention one thing because I think it's important for us. Chemists with Disabilities has a travel program for that will support a student to go to each of the national meetings of student with disabilities of any type and they will pay for that student to go to a national meeting. So if you're interested in that, go on the ACS website and you'll get it. But thank you all for giving up a day. I mean, uh, the attendance has been wonderful, the response has been wonderful, and I think the speakers have been absolutely incredible. I know I've learned an awful lot. So thank you to all of you. <laughs>